Hey, Dunk. Hey, mate. How are you? Not bad. Mate, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I thought I thought it'd probably be good to explain what I do, um, just yeah. for a bit of clarity. Um, so I just finished playing rugby last year and jumped into coaching this year. I was uh, played all three positions in the front row. Very, very average rugby player, but I could scrum a little bit, so I kind of got away with it. Um, and literally just started coaching this year, and I, I was like an assistant forwards coach, kind of not really doing anything. And then some stuff happened at our club, and. I became the second grade coach and the forwards coach. So I've just, you know, my learning has just gone through the roof. And I kind of started this as, well, I, you know, I just started a podcast because I've always wanted to. And it's kind of become a, a development tool for me and, and a lot of the other young coaches that, that have been listening. So, mate, um, yeah, does, it, does that make sense? You've answered some of your own questions here then. Yeah, yeah. It's a um, good way to learn, good way to share ideas. Well, yeah, you know, and I, I never thought I'd get guys like yourself and I, I did one with Pat Lamb and, you know, so it's been great for me, but a lot of other people are getting something out of it as well. Um, how are you, mate? Is everything good? Yeah, all good. Yep. We're living in paradise, locked down. <laughs> are, you, where, are you in New Zealand or Japan? Yeah, yeah, no. yeah we're in New Zealand. Um so we live at a place called Waihi Beach, which is a little, little sort of um, quirky beachside town in um, in the Coromandel. Beautiful, we love Beautiful. it. Half your life. Yeah, yeah. No, um, so, so I, I sent you through some questions, and um, I, I was trying to work out the best way to do this, and whether to have a theme or get really rugby nerdy. But I'm just going to throw some questions at you and yeah. see what happens. Um, so, mate, firstly, thank you very much for doing this. One of, the, one of the things I got asked for the first time this year, and it really made me think, um, by our head coach at South, is, is why do you coach? So, Wayne, why do you coach? Well, I, I coached. Um, I started coaching because, because I love the game. Because um, I played and started coaching in the amateur era. Um, I think that the day I stopped playing or the day I realised I needed to stop playing was one of the worst days of my life. And I wanted to, I still wanted to stay part of the contest and um, be a part of that team spirit and, and be around rugby guys. So that's why I decided to get into coaching. Um, I had a, a really fortunate experience. So when, when um, I was a young player for Canterbury, when I first started playing for them, I had a mentor, um, a guy called Laurie O'Reilly, who was a great coach and, and sort of the initiator of women's rugby in New Zealand. He was a great senior club coach in, in Canterbury. And um, I was, I'd just arrived in, in Christchurch and I was playing for a club called Belfast. We'd played university and this guy, Laurie, asked me to, if I wanted to come around and meet him at his place. So I went around on a Sunday, um, didn't know him from Bar of Soap really, but he said he wanted to talk to me about coaching. And so I wandered around there and it was a bit different, Laurie. Um, so I knocked on the door and he opened the front door in a caftan. And I came from a little rural town called Pataru. I'd never seen a guy in a dress before. <laughs> uh, he was a top family lawyer in the country. Um, he uh, became commissioner for children uh, a government appointee and uh, he invited me to some coaching courses that he was running it was a uh, it was the start of being fascinated by the craft I was um, exposed to coaches like Pierre Bulpreur and and Jim Greenwood who Laurie brought out to, to help run the, the coaching camps that he that took place and that really inspired me I think to um, to be interested in and coaching help help me as a player, um, but it created a real interest, I think, in, in becoming a coach. Um, one thing on that, something I found very interesting is is learning all the different areas of the game that I, I didn't fully understand playing in the front row. Like, you know, it was a great surprise to me that what halfbacks do isn't just get to the ruck and pass the ball. There's there's actually more to it. So, so how did you go about learning the other areas of the game? that you maybe weren't so familiar with? Because you were a 5'8", or fly half, weren't you? Yeah. No, I know how difficult it would have been for you with 
you head on head on the ground and you bum in the air. You, you've seen the game from a different perspective. Um, yeah, it, it, that's part of the challenge, isn't it? Is is to learn areas outside um, your playing expertise. I've never really done that. I still don't know much about scrummaging or lineouts. I, I know what sort of ball we want, but um, not quite sure how how to get it. Uh, however. My, my first real coaching job was at the end of my um, sort of playing career in New Zealand. It was 1986, and John Kerwin, who, who's a great mate of mine, he, he'd put me onto a club in Italy to go and, be, um, to go and play a season there and, and help with their coaching. So I turned up, and sort of unbeknown to me, I was head coach, <laughs> and uh, also I was their foreign player. And... They'd given me a, an assistant coach who played on the wing for Italy. Not only that, he, I'd been learning Italian, you know, sort of classical Dante's Italian. He spoke uh, a local dialect. So there I, I had, a, had an outside back as my forward coach and uh, a guy <laughs> never spoke Italian. So I had to adapt pretty quickly. And uh, we sort of worked together. He and I were, were great mates. Um, we became really close and we, and we sort of worked together on forward play and um, learned a wee bit, but yeah, I wouldn't say it was a strength of mine. And what about something like, uh, something I got asked as well this year is, is coaching philosophy. Is, is it important for young coaches to have a coaching philosophy? And, and if so, why? Oh, 100%. Um, you know, uh, I've got... I. I moved into coaching with probably four beliefs about the game through through having played for various teams. The first one was that realization that people will rise to a challenge if it's their challenge, not actually yeah. going to uh, rise to your challenge or my challenge. I think um, that empowerment, um, evolving the players and everything that you do, and making sure that they own own the team and and own the challenges, I think that's that's really important. Um, I had a second belief that I'd much rather help guys work on their strengths than on, on what they can't do. Um, so clearly, if, you're, um, if you've got a weakness that's really specific to your area and important in your area, yeah, you've got to work on it. Um, but I think you, you get the best out of people by really developing their strengths and making their strengths better. And that, that's what, to me, that's what creates a champion. And then you work on Maybe an 80-20 rule, 80% um, strengths and 20% things that they can improve uh, that are important to their, their position. So that, that sort of underscored my whole coaching philosophy. Um, I also, ha having started in, in Italy, it was a unique challenge uh, because I was learning the language as well as how to coach. And I started asking questions of the players rather than instructing. Uh, because I wanted, A, I wanted to keep learning the language and get better at it, but B, uh, I wanted to know what they knew about the game and what they understood, uh, what they saw, um, what they did when they saw that and what they'd do next time. And so I started asking questions and just coincidentally, I found that it was a really good way to create a bit more self-awareness. Yeah. You know, I think all of us as players, we've had coaches in our ears and it's gone in one ear <laughs> and out the other. Yeah. Uh, I think by asking questions that give you a descriptive answer, you, you, you help players to retain the knowledge and, and understand a bit better. So, um, yeah, so I started that pretty early in my, my coaching life. And the fourth thing was, again, being in Italy, um, the methodology was much, much more global than what I'd been exposed to. Uh, and, and, and what I mean by that, um, I'd come through a sort of analytical um, uh, methodology of coaching where you know you taught where to put your hands um, how to catch the ball what to pass off you know re really minor detail whereas in Italy I was exposed more to a, to an, a French philosophy or methodology called um, global rugby and essentially it's game based learning and, and I really liked that idea of um, playing the game of creating constraints or exaggerating the size of the field, number of balls, number of defenders, number of attackers, 
and creating situations that the players were going to be put in um, during the game. And then then developing the skills that are, that were relevant to those games. So that's basically how I, how I coached in Italy. And then uh, when I came back to New Zealand, um, apply, applied that approach, approach back here. You know, a lot of coaches uh, get concerned about errors, whereas for me, um, uncertainty and making mistakes is a catalyst for learning. Yeah. And, and I don't mean stupid errors that are repetitive and, and shouldn't be made. I mean errors that occurred um, because of the difficulty of what you're doing or, or the new learning that you're, you're giving the players to undergo. And would I think you that's, that's a really so, important part of, of my coaching. Would you set people up so that they do make mistakes in a drill? Uh, what I do is try and um, give new information uh, and new uh, ideas that then will initially create some mistakes. And, and really what you're looking for is players to, to not be scared of, of making mistakes. And, and that to me is a real um, start of them learning how to, how to get better. Um, one, one of the things I read when doing some research for this was a, uh, an article, I think it was Rugby Pass, but you, you had a great quote in it, in it and it was following the herd doesn't cut the mustard and if it was about how a team should have the opportunity to be unique and should be unique uh, as coaches, how, how do we how do we work out what the uniqueness of our group is, and then how do you cultivate it? That's possibly a very in depth question, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that quote was around. Um, you know, you can play the game in, in many ways. Now it was it was easy for me in my day. Um, because I never saw coaching as, as a career. It was something I loved doing. And as I said before, I wanted to be part of a team. Um, so you didn't really care about putting your head above the parapet. It might get cut off, but it wasn't going to cost you a career. Um, and, I, and I understand how difficult that is today. You know, you get young coaches coming in and it's much easier to follow what everyone else is doing and, and try and do it as well as, as they can do. Uh, but for me, yeah, every every person, every team's got an opportunity to to be unique, and everyone's got the opportunity to live the habits of the best in the world. And you don't have to be the best in the world to to live those habits. Um, you know, the, the, it's up to you. So I think um, that you know, I think there are things around um, uh, Identity, but it's a, it's a bit of a buzzword these days. But uh, who you are and who we are as a team, yeah. uh, and there's a uniqueness around that. I mean, every team comes from has got a different history. For example, I'm coaching um, or I'm director of coaching for Kabelco Steelers in Japan, and we're different to every other team over there. We've got a different history. We're a 96-year-old club. Um, we've started off as a is a tough game to teach character to steel workers and to, to develop them. And so that's a thread that runs through everything we do. Um, but, but I think every team's got that opportunity to, to look to the past, which can, can shape the future. Um, legacies, I think, are a really important concept. You know, you're, you're stewards of a jersey for a really short time and, and that idea of passing the jersey on to someone else in a better state than when you got it is, is a really powerful one. Um, I coached Jerome Kino, for example, for, for a lot of years. And I remember sitting down with him uh, before he was leaving to go to France. And he was concerned that he hadn't made the jersey better in his time. Really? Yeah. really? <laughs> probably been player of two World Cups, 2011 and 2015. But it's what drove him. You see, and he got the jersey from Jerry Collins, who, who he hero worshipped. And um, so that was something that drove him um, through that time. So I think those things are really key. Coaches tend to go into pre-season and they want to get all the fundamental skills done and the, and, the, and the game plan done and the patterns and all that sort of stuff. I understand that. But to me, the, the most critical thing in that period is to, is to establish what drives you. Um, uh, look at the past to um, to create the future and, and 
determine what you want to do as a as a team. And part of that uniqueness is then feeding that. You know, you don't have to use the language that's traditional rugby. I don't like defence, for example, because I think it's it's a bit of a negative imagery. I, I like I like to um, involve visualisation in the coaching. So um, I always change the name of defence um, based on stuff we've done around our identity and who we are and where we've come from and just create different pictures about um, about what, you, what, what each part of the, the, the game actually means. So, for example, in Japan, um, a counter-attack we call Kin. Kin is a derivative of um, Rinken Jutsu, who was the alchemist who turned lead into gold. And, you know, to me, that's that's what you're trying to do in counter-attack is get off the ground, don't be lead. Um, the ball's gold because you've just got it back. And... Um, be vibrant about how you use it. So, so I think all, all those things can really, um, really create a strong team with um, a drive to to do everything to to make the stuff better. You know that you're trying to do. Yeah. yeah so like using, okay. using stuff like the wall for defence, or you know something like yeah. that, that well, has a strong yeah. metaphor to it, rather than just saying defence. Exactly. But create. Create your own language, um, create your own imagery. Uh, when I was at Chiefs with Dave Rennie, um, we used um, local uh, ideas and local um, words from Tainui, who settled, Māori, who settled the area, you know, back in the 1200s, 1300s. And uh, that was important for that team at that time to, to have that identity. And, and be be sort of really special. Also, it means if you're if speaking that language, no one else can understand you. You've got a double benefit. <laughs> um, when you're trying new ideas, because um, someone I spoke to, Simon Cron, said to make sure to ask you about innovation. So shout out to him. Where do you look for new ideas and how do you test them? Because I, I can imagine if you're going to test something at the all-black level, you kind of want to make sure that it works before you try it. Yeah, um, we never we never thought like that um, when I was in the All Blacks uh, because we tried all sorts of stuff and a lot of the stuff we tried didn't work. Um, but we weren't scared to we weren't scared to have a crack at it. And they don't write books about things that don't work. They usually write books about things that do work. So you yeah. never hear about the failures that, that we had in, in terms of innovations, initiatives that we brought into the team. But how, how do you do that? Um, I learned a really valuable lesson in 1997. So Graham Henry was coach of the Blues at the time and they were the champion team in, in 96 and 97. And in those days, um, the coach of the champion super rugby team made a presentation to all the other super coaches of New Zealand. It was an initiative by New Zealand Rugby Union. And so I went to this month um, in 1998 and uh, Graham stood up on stage, all the other coaches are there, pen in hand, and he told us everything that the, uh, that the Blues had done, everything from um, how far away the halfback was when he received the pass from the eight, from a scrum, how flat he needed to be, all, all his patterns. And I talked to him afterwards and said, um, you know, it was really interesting, but you gave away all your ideas. And what had happened was as soon as he walked out of that room, he had to come up with new ideas. Yeah. And, and, and so what he was doing, that the blues were there and he was giving everyone um, ideas to get to there but of course what he was doing was going to there trying to take yeah. it so he was staying ahead so I think forcing yourself to um, to learn to innovate to come up with new ideas um, is, is important and sharing's certainly a way to do that um, other ways like clearly reading Reading books is the way that you know, I'm a real avid reader, and uh, there are a lot of great books around that um, have shaped my career. There's not a lot of uh, 
and uh, what's the word? There's not a lot of ideas that are unique to you anymore. You know, it's just a matter of picking up what you can, what suits your personality, what you think could add to your um, philosophy or your methodology. And that's what shaped you rather than original ideas. I think it's taken from, from everything else and then, then you become an original by the way you combine those things. So um, reading, going on podcasts, um, yeah. doing Zooms, during lockdown, um, the coaches and I from Kobe, we, we ran Wednesday, wise Wednesday sessions with different coaches from different sports, um, high performance people from all around the world. And I find that really useful. Cross code um, professional development. Um, I've done quite. A, I've done a bit of work with Melbourne Storm, for example, over a number of years, and Craig Bellamy and Frank Panisi, um, who Bellamy obviously great coach and and Panisi a general manager. They used to come into the All Blacks as part of their PD, and then I started doing the same with them, and um, consequently did a bit of work with some mentoring and and some leadership stuff there. So all that. All that adds to your um, to your bag of trips, tricks, I guess, as a as a coach, and and you're always learning. It, it just to me, it, it never finishes. And, mm. and that growth mindset, I think, is really important for a coach that you're prepared to keep searching for things and and always trying to get better. And no matter how difficult it is, um, have a crack at it. Mate, just on that. Um, one of the things I found interesting is that doing, doing these podcasts, the, the subject of mental performance has come up over and over again. And I was lucky enough to speak to Dave Diggle, who's the Wallabies mental performance coach last week. And I, I still get the feeling that it's, it's kind of an underused area of sport and the game in general. But, but you're one of the early adapters of using a sports psychologist with Gilbert and Oka. What, what did you see? I think, was it the 80s that you started doing it? Yeah, I, I first met um, Gilbert in 82. He, he was teaching at Hillmorton High School in Christchurch. He was captain of the New Zealand volleyball team at the time. And we just started chatting over a cup of tea one day about our performances. And um, my performances were like that. <laughs> you know, I was, I was a running 5'8", and, and I tended to have games where I was really good and games where I was really bad, which wasn't wasn't the way to be as a Canterbury or Canterbury player or All Black. So I was seeking um, some ideas to become a bit more con consistent in my performance. So we started chatting and he put me onto a few things. Um, I started doing visualisation, for example. I had a routine of that during the week and, and pre-game. Um, started just doing some basic uh, mental, applying some mental skills um, ideas to the game, you know, staying in the present, not worrying about the past, not looking at the scoreboard, just focusing on next task. That, that sort of stuff that's pretty run of the middle of the day. But for me, it was a, a huge, um, a huge learning curve for me, and it really helped me with my playing career. Uh, subsequently to that, when I started coaching, um, I started really with Canterbury B and uh, Canary Sevens. So Canary B in 89, a guy called John Mills, who played who had played hooker the teams I was playing for, um, he and I took over Canary B. Um, Steve Hanson was my captain. And uh, Gild and Oka became our sports psychologist, if you like, which was pretty um, revolutionary in those days. So... Uh, all the boys had a had an exercise book. They used to come along pre-training. We'd do a 20-minute session with Gilbert. I'd write down notes um, in, in the book. In the, in the middle pages, we had a, a what-if section. So they'd come up with um, things that could derail their performance and what, what the solution would be. And at the back, they had a glossary of terms. Now, that's pretty pretty radical for those days. Absolutely. But, so then, constant, then subsequently we went through years and years of working together, Gilbert and I. Um, and then when the game turned professional um, and I started coaching Crusaders in 1997, uh, I was really lucky to have a young CEO called Steve Chu who um, had a pretty progressive mindset 
And so when I went to him about employing Gilbert as a as a um, sports psychologist, he had a bit of a battle, I, I'd imagine, with the board to, to get that approved. But um, finally, I was allowed to employ Gilbert as, as our sports psych. So he became a really valuable part of that team and has been part of virtually every team that I've coached since. It's just, you know, um, we, we were always told all your career, you're told that it's top two inches that count in the game, but you were never never taught how to yeah how to use that, you know. And so to me, it was just an obvious progression from understanding that it's important to, to be right upstairs. But how do you do that? Yeah. Um, just, just on the coaching team side of thing, what makes a good coaching team? And, like when you, Steve, and Graham were all working together at the All Blacks, you're obviously all, all three head coaches in, in your own right. How, how did you make that work? Was it something you talked about? Was it natural? Like how did that all work? Um, yeah, I think the, the first thing you, you have to do is, is research who you want on your team and who, who you want to work with. I think that's critical. Um, you've got to have complementary skills, clearly. Um, You've got to be able to trust each other. And a really important part, I think, is being able to debate and having the ability to, to um, put your ideas forward. But also, if you lose the debate, being able to disagree and commit totally to it. The last thing you want is um, disharmony in, in your coaching team. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think that's true in every team I've been in. You, you, you need to, whilst you need to get on as, as mates and trust each other, you've got to be able to have those strong discussions. And then um, if it doesn't go your way, commit totally to, to what the group decides. And, and that was a big thing with Steve and, and Graham and I, was that we've all got pretty strong ideas and... We argue pretty, pretty strongly, but um, we always committed totally once the decision was made. I think that those things are really important. Um, and also uh, being prepared to, obviously with us, we were all prepared to try things and to innovate and to um, go against uh, what all the other teams in the world were trying to do. And you've got to be able to buy into that together as well. Now you're putting together teams uh, in Japan, coaching teams. What do you look for in, in young coaches and in the coaching team that you're putting together? Well, I think a growth mindset is really important. So um, what I mean by that is not just being stuck in your own little area um, and following what everyone else is doing, being able to, um, to look further afield, um, acquire different skills, try things that you're not sure whether they're going to work or not, but um, a slightly different to, to the way other people are doing them. Um, I like guys who can get in the crow's nest. You know, if, if you're in, a, in the America's Cup, you want to be able to look to the horizon and see what the wind's doing. I think that's important with rugby. And, and it's going to be really relevant, I think, over the next couple of years because the rules are going to change. The um, Globally... Uh, there's concern obviously around the toughness of the game and the amount of concussions Um, so it's obvious that there's going to be some law changes how you adapt to those over the next couple of years and um, how you get an edge on others I think is really important Um, so so that's what I'm looking for Um, coaches have the ability to do that uh, who are open to learning and keen to innovate and, and try things that maybe no one else is doing. How do you look at failure? Some, something, I've, something I've been looking into in my own life is, is the, the subject of failure. And it, actually failure is a good thing because it helps you to learn and to improve. How, how did you look at it as a coach in, in your own life? Uh, yeah, well, we're all competitive, aren't we? And uh, it's difficult to take failure. Um, so I, I just made little rules for myself, like gave myself 24 hours to, to get over it. Um, 
I never, I wasn't a coach that ever came into the changing room and sort of um, bollocked the team or um, questioned their their approach or or their effort or anything. I, I only ever thanked them because I knew it wasn't the time to, to let your emotions run wild. You, you needed, I needed time to settle down, um, thank the players for what they'd done during the week and during the game. And then try and put it right over the next 24 hours. So um, I think that's that's really key to, to try and take the emotion out of it, win or lose, and just be there for the boys and um, but then put in the hours next day or two to, to try and get it right. Um, optimism, I think, is a real key part of that, Duncan. Um, yeah. There's a great book by Martin Seligman on learned optimism. And just quickly, it's a study from Penn State University that he's done over, over like 40 odd years, um, where he's tested students coming into the university, categorized them through his testing as either optimists or pessimists. Yeah. Um, then he's taken a group of pessimists and taught them optimism. And then he's followed them through life. And there's some interesting results. It's a good book, I think all coaches should read. Um, and learned optimism is something that um, I had to undergo. Um, learn how to dispute that you couldn't do something, um, something went wrong, uh, the team didn't go well. Um, just, just the ability to say, well, I've done it before. Um, I know what to do. I can do it again. I just got it wrong this time. Um, or, you know, it might have been that a referee decision went against you or the bounce of the ball or we weren't quite there mentally or whatever it was. Um, being able to understand that every dog has its day and your day is going to be next week and, and um, you know, it again. Learned, learned Optimism. That's the book. That's what the book's called. Yeah. Learned Optimism by Martin Seligman. Okay. I'll check he's that got, out. He's, he's also got another book um, that I've read recently called Flourish. And we have a program, we have a mental health program in, in Kobe called Flourish that um, essentially we're trying to create more grit and more resilience in a society that's finding um, that there are more mental health issues. It's, that it's more of it today than it was back in our day. I'm sure, I'm sure there were the same issues back in our day, but you never spoke about it. Today, it's much more open, much more out there. And I think every coach has a responsibility to put some sort of program in place to um, help players through that. And more than that, um, create the mental toughness to to overcome some of the issues and you know any community um unhappiness and depression is contagious you know if you're in house a um and there's unhappiness and and um sadness in that house it's probably gonna the other houses are probably gonna catch it and rugby's yeah. no different but the blockbuster finding for me was that happiness and optimism are even more contagious and so it's really important that I think you you do some research on that, um, work out some initiatives on on how to achieve it and put it in place in your team. Yeah. Um, just on that, I'm doing a course uh, through Yale University at the moment called The Science of Wellbeing. So anyone listening to this, I'd highly recommend that as well. It's ex excellent, excellent course. Mate, is there anything that you've changed your mind on lately that you used to be certain about? Every day. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes actually you need to sit down and have a think about what used to be successful for you. Because sometimes you can go forward so fast and be so different to what you were a few years ago when you were um, when you were certain then about what you were doing. It pays to go back and have a look at that and. Um, I'm all for um, experimenting around the fringes, but also I think having some um, bone deep philosophies and, and ideas is really important. So what what are your smacks? We call them smacks. So what are your specific methodical and consistent behaviours that, that ensure success? And it's, yeah. I think it's important to always look back at that and um, and maybe you've got to adopt some of those behaviours again, um, even though you're 10 years in the future, because uh, 
they should never change. So yeah, there, there are lots of things. And as I said before, um, we made a lot of mistakes um, within the All Blacks. I remember before the 2011 World Cup, um, we tried a lot of different stuff over the preceding eight years. And uh, I brought in John Donoghue, who's, who's the great defence and contact coach from Melbourne Storm. I brought him in before the World Cup to, to do some um, chop tackling technique stuff with the boys. And as we're walking off the field, Ali Williams came up and put his arm around me and said, that'll be the best thing you've ever done. <laughs> and so, you know, you do all these things that um, maybe don't work, but um, you've got to keep trying and and uh, keep keep pushing the boundaries, I think, uh, to try and make things better. And not having this fear of failure, it, it, that seemed like something that was quite important for you guys, is not worrying about failure, but worry about not trying. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The, um, there are certain periods um, in the All Blacks, and I can recall we were under real pressure. Um, 2007, for example, at the World Cup, we... We failed in the quarterfinal against France. We were, we were favourites. Um, we had uh, more scrutiny than the Prime Minister. You can imagine coming back to New Zealand, uh, there, was a, there was a report commissioned on us. <laughs> so uh, some recommendations of what we need to do. And it was good, you know, that um, the, the report suspected that um, there were some things out of a control that, that added to us um, losing that game, but there's some things that we needed to improve on. And decision-making was one of them. Um, playing under pressure was another. And so the report was a catalyst for us having to ser take those things seriously. And if you think about the, the back in those days, we went a lot of... Um, ideas around how you could actually measure decision making but uh, that's what we decided to do was try and try and make up a KPI that um, gave us an indication of how how effective our decision making was so we went ahead with that um, it was a it was pretty simple really but it was it was based on the on play outcome so you know what was the outcome of, of each play? We started off with me looking at the decisions and and sort of weighting them on whether they were good or bad ones. But of course, it's only my then it was only my view against the players. So yeah. play the outcome was was a good, um, effective and factual way to to uh, see whether the the decision made was um, an appropriate one and effective or not. So we had to do things like that. Um, we had to do a lot of work on uh, getting out of the that stage of, of fright, flight or fight, which we've clearly been in uh, against the French and get into that ice cold mental space of um, intensity but clarity and being able to execute. And to do that, you've, we decided to take it out of the classroom and put it on the training field. And so we had four years of, of trying to put guys under real, under insane pressures at times to um, to really test their ability to, to get back in the present, um, execute their tasks properly, stay calm, and um, and be together as a team. So uh, they were interesting days. You can imagine um, the the sorts of things you got to do to put them under pressure it can create some conflict uh, amongst the the staff and the players but it's, it's what we felt we needed to do. So I think they were innovations that um, that were essentially forced on us, but we were prepared to make them. And, and then, then I look at um, 2009. So we, we, we were starting to go quite well. 2008, we went well. We won Tri-Nations. Um, we went well on, on end of year tour. 2009, the game changed. I don't know if you remember it, but it became a really kicking orientated game. It was almost like tennis because the, the laws at the breakdown, um, the interpretations had changed and it was much more in favour of the defensive team than the attacking team. 
And so early in Super Rugby, you can see teams deciding we're not going to counter-attack, we're not going to play in our half because we're liable to get penalised or lose the ball. So it became a kicking game. And it was like tennis and it was a hell of a boring. I remember the um, some of the, the coaching meetings that we had during that time, Steve, um, Graham, myself, um, Gilbert Anoka and Brian Hoare, who was, who was our mentor, we decided as a group that probably World Rugby was going to have to change the change the law interpretation because no one was going to be watching the game if we kept doing this over the next couple of years. So we decided to um, take a punt and play an attacking, counter-attacking game that no one else was playing. It cost us three tests uh, against South Africa, so we got beaten three times that year by South Africa. Uh, yeah. which was difficult to take and you can imagine again what that was like the public of, of New Zealand um, but we were certain in our own minds that we were doing the right thing and, and to persevere with that game because sooner or later the game that the laws were going to change and they did so they changed um, over Christmas and so uh, as we entered 2010 I felt we were a mile ahead of the rest of the world in terms of being able to adapt to the new law changes. And I think that was a massive thing in us winning in 2011. It just, just lasted long enough <laughs> until we thrashed France 8-7 in that final. <laughs> but, um, but it was a real, it was a real key, a real key to us. But um, have faith that um, we could play this game, have faith that the game was going to change and then um, we, we would have the edge that we needed. That, that's so interesting to me because I, I feel like a lot of coaches get scared because you lose three tests for the All Blacks. So I can only imagine the pressure that you guys would have been under. But having the the foresight to go, no, we're, we're right here. You know, is it something that you guys sat down and, and, and talked about in depth or like, like how did you have that confidence? Because I feel like a lot of young coaches would go, oh, no, we'll go back to what we've been doing. Because it worked. Yes, that, that would have been the easy way, I think, was would have been to do what everyone else was doing and into that kicking game and hope that the other team would make a mistake in their half. But it wasn't our collective philosophy. You know, um, we we did, when we took over the All Blacks, we felt we had the best players in the world and that we had to bring the best out of them. And, and we just stayed true to that. Um, it was difficult at times. You know, we went through some really tough times and uh, I'd previously, I'd basically been sacked in 2001 as head coach of the All Blacks. So I'd, I'd been through, you know, that was a difficult period, came back into the All Blacks. Um, we then had 2007 and, and between 2007 and 2011, uh, they were difficult years because we are under a lot of pressure. Um, we were trying to be true to... to what we believed in, uh, and uh, it would be fair to say there was a, a, a lot of scrutiny on what we were doing, and it really wasn't until we won that World Cup, I think, that um, things changed and, and it got a bit easier publicly and, and also with the media. Um, but that, they were, you know, the eight years from 2004, 2004 to 2011 weren't all easy. Yeah. It's a difficult um, and you just got to stay strong and, and stay together and um, believe in yourselves to, to keep forging on. Um, mate, I'm super grateful for your time. I've just got a couple of rapid fire questions and then I'll, cool. I'll let you go. Um, we mentioned a couple of books before, but is there any one book that you'd recommend to anyone? Yeah, um, probably Stephen Covey's um, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. I think it's a great um, compass for anyone, really, whether you're a coach, anyway, just, just for life. On um, got, got some really great ideas in there, um, based on on being a good person, really, and, and what that looks like. Um, so that I think that made um, a big difference to me. That there's, there's another book uh, from a rugby point of view that I found really useful with players and I presented at a conference in Redondo Beach 
Los Angeles in 2007 and guys from um, West Point Military Academy were there. And they're telling me about the book that they give each of their recruits called The Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. And it, it's an outstanding book on the warrior mindset. So they're two books, I think, that have, have made a real um, difference. All, all the stuff you've learned over the years, is it just stored away in the, the memory box or have, do you journal or, or how, how do you... How do you keep hold of everything? Yeah, I'm a big um, journaler. I, um, I've never been one to back my intuition. I've always wanted to do that with, um, with data, with notes, um, with research. Uh, so as a, as a coach, for example, in, in whatever area I was in, whether it was attack or counterattack or, or defence, didn't make any difference. So I'm, I'm a studier of the opposition. Um, I'm, a, I'm a detailed note taker. Uh, my journal's full of stuff that England, how England played, and how, how all the tier one teams in the world played, Australia, South Africa. Um, and I relied on, on that data to give me the confidence to, to go ahead with what I want to do. There are other coaches that aren't like that who have more now about the game and, and perhaps a better feeling than I do. For Steve Hansen might be one of those where they, they don't do that detail, but they've, um, they have a feel for, for what needs to be done. So, yeah, that, that's me. I'm not, I'm not a natural. Um, I, I based everything I did on hard work, and it's not easy doing that. It's not an easy way to live, um, but I found that was a way for me to, to be at my best. You know, but one of the big issues, um, you know, Duncan, with the All Blacks, for example, is is not let winning become your enemy, and so you need to. Um, it's easy to um, get the attitude right and uh, work hard at getting the game right when you're losing, because you know that drives you. Um, but you know, when you're coaching the All Blacks, you've got to be able to do that when you're winning. And so that, that was always a challenge for us. So I, I never changed either way. I just um, I just kept doing the same sort of routines. We win or so win or lose, it was always the same every week. We can we did this well. We can do this better. Let's you know. Yeah. Um, where do you think the game's heading? Um, I think there are going to be some uh, massive law changes over the next couple of years. I know domestically. Uh, New Zealand rugby are, are looking at some experimental law variations. Um, in Australia, there's a there's a, a really smart group of coaches um, and ex players looking at the same sort of thing. Um, you know, the guys like Rod McQueen, Barry Honan, um, Andrew Slack, great great men of the game. Some of the great thinkers of the game. And uh, I've been looking at some of their ideas around how the game could get better. Um, world Rugby have real concerns, clearly and rightfully, over the toughness of the game, the toughness of the collisions, the breakdown area, um, the amount of concussions in the game. Um, you'd be aware of those players in Europe who um, have formed a group and are talking to, to World Rugby at the moment around compensation for for their um, head issues at, at the moment. So I think it's, um, it's a major for the game. Um, for kids coming through, uh, we all want our kids to be able to play rugby and our grandkids to be able to play rugby, but you also want them to be a bit safer than they are today. So, yeah. um, so there are all sorts of initiatives I think are going to change, and that's, that's where being in the crow's nest is important for coaches. But also, um, I learned really early under Laurie O'Reilly that the, um, the safest way to play rugby is also the most effective. So things like chin off the chest, into contact, eyes open, um, is not only the, the safest way to play, but it's most effective. And it worries me today when, when I watch the, the game and the nine passes to to that group of forwards, normally to the second man. Um, he seldom passes it, puts his head down, charges into the contact, you've got two cleaners on, and then you do it again. Um, it's putting that head down in the contact is unsafe, but it's also not a positive one to play because you can't see where the offload 
opportunity is. Yeah. You can't learn from your plays because you didn't see anything. And so whatever happens over the next couple of years with law changes, as I say, there will be some. Um, you've got to take the coaching movement with you. And I think our coach education has to improve to, um, to, to tie the two things together. If, if you're going to change the game, then coaches have to be positive about that rather than finding out ways to beat it. What's the biggest piece of advice that you give to young coaches when you speak to them? Um, that's a good question. If I was talking to myself um, as a young coach coming through, I'd use one of Covey's concepts from, from his book, and that would be start with the end in mind. So um, imagine yourself at your own funeral and imagine what people are saying about you and then live your life based on what you want them, what you want them to be saying about you when you go. I think that would be a key, key thing for me. Um, don't, don't worry too much about what people say um, about what you're doing. Be, be true to yourself and um, uh, be the person that you want to be. Mate, two more questions and then I'll leave you alone. Maybe not a short answer for this one, but I've got to ask, what do the Wallabies have to do to win the Bledisloe Cup? Um, well, there's some, um, clearly some mental issues there, aren't there? Um, looks like the next two games are going to be at Eden Park. I've been there since 1986. Um, so whatever, uh, at some stage you're going to have to win there. Uh, it's how you make it, how you make it tomorrow. That, that's the challenge. Um, it's a massive, massive challenge. I, I've coached quite a bit with Dave Rennie. He's a good mate of mine. He's he's outstanding. Absolutely outstanding in, in every area. Um, he's a great, got a great attacking mindset as a, as a coach. I think he's got to continue with that. Um, he, he's not one that follows others. He's true to, to his philosophy and... Uh, so I think that's going to be one of the keys. Um, clearly, they're going to have to meet that Eden Park um, attitude that the All Blacks have. You know, it it really um, it's it's just a a great tradition that the players a the players are hugely driven by Blues Low Cup, and secondly, um, that tradition of winning at Eden Park is 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 really strong. Um, it's a place that unites a lot of the families. Um, you know, it's it's um, it's just become an important part of that Bledisloe Cup history. And so, overcoming that's going to be it's going to be a major for the Wallabies. Uh, I don't know how they're going to do it. I've got the man in charge that could could possibly do it, but it's not going to be easy. Last question, mate, and it might might tie into the, the question about advice for coaches. What advice would you give 18-year-old Wayne Smith? Um, well, that would be easy now because I'd give them the advice that we've um, talked about over the last hour. Um, but I think that, that point I made um, around other coaches, uh, live your life, um, you know, put yourself in that situation where you're at your own funeral, see what people are saying about you, and is that how you want to be seen? And if it's not, change it. Um, be, be who you really want to be and, and live that life. Mate, wonderful. Great way to end, mate. Thank, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Duncan. Mate, all, all the you. best, and um, thank you, mate. Thanks, mate. All the best. Catch, catch ya. All right, guys, that's today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this week's episode or any of our episodes, please make sure you subscribe on whatever platform you listen on. And please make sure you follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Wandering Bear Sports. Thank you so much, and we'll catch you again next week.